Hello, my name is Stefan Burns. I'm a geophysicist with Geometrics, and today we're going to process an impossible data set. We're going to learn some tips and tricks and techniques on how you can take a data set that looks really bad, looks impossible to process, and learn how to salvage good data from it and get good results. Hello, and today we're going to process some atom seismograph surface wave data in size imager. SW, and we're going to look at what might be considered an impossible data set. A data set that just looks like it can't be processed, but we're going to find clever ways around that and process the data. Now, of course, if this is really important, it's best to go back to the site and collect it. But this site would have had this happen, I believe, no matter what. Now, there are a few ways passive seismic data can end up looking bad. It depends on a few key variables. The first one would be the coupling to the ground. How well are your sensors, your geophones coupled to the ground? Is the spike planted nicely? Is it in rough terrain, loose terrain? Do you not get it in all the way? That has a big impact on data quality because that's how your data flows from the surface to your digital sensor. And if that link is not clean, your data will not be clean. You can also have other factors like noise. Maybe you have car noise or you have airplane noise, construction noise noise will have a big impact on your final data quality. If you have a device that limits your survey geometry, you won't be as flexible in the field and your overall data quality will be worse than it would have been with a flexible survey design. And we have three array files. We have our array and then we have our split one, our split two, I'll explain that. But for now, we're just gonna open up our total array file which has 18 receivers, hit okay. And just go through everything. And already we can see that there's some issues with the data. This is not typical. Typically, if you have a good data, you'll have good coherency at one, two, three, all these different frequencies all across the top. And here, it's already looking bad. And we're also losing coherency really quick. Like we're dropping off very fast, even for just 10 meters. And then, and then sometimes it jumps up and looks good. Uh, I mean, here you can see it's higher and then it's lower and then it's higher again. So it, this is bizarre to say the least. And actually, we can see our different time blocks have an effect on it. Um, the color, the red line corresponds to the, the one minute block that you're selected. So this, this first block here is not helping. This looks pretty, pretty bad. If you delete that, it'll look better. And, you know, you can play detective a little bit, but to go through all these different spacings and go through every minute for each spacing would take forever. But just to look at it, you know, this data looks, looks like it can be processed, but there's, it's just a little off. So we'll click the phase velocity uh, button here and let's see what it looks like. 30 Hertz for the max frequency, hit okay. Ugh. I don't mean like what do you what do you do with that? Okay, we're looking at phase velocity dispersion curve, and let's take a moment to understand what we're looking at. On the y-axis is phase velocity, and on the x-axis is frequency. So you also have this range of colors. But first, we're going to talk about the fact that you're seeing waveforms across all the different frequencies. There's no gaps in the data with passive seismic words, oh, we didn't record this frequency for this velocity at all. You might have extremely low coherencies though. Coherencies are how alike are the waveforms between geophones, and that of course depends on the frequency. So a geophone in the field is going to be detecting phase velocities all the way from zero to 2500 hertz and more right just tons and tons of data but you with the other geophones you can then determine okay what was the dominant velocity that i was recording what was the dominant velocity i was recording at each different slice of frequency at two hertz what was it at five hertz what was it at 10 hertz what was the dominant phase velocity so when you're looking at this graph and you see the colored regions, know that in size imager software, blue is the highest coherency and in magenta is the lowest. 
and green is kind of this middle ground. It can give you a good band of, on where things are going. Uh, some of our competitor software have the axes swapped and they also have the color swapped. They really lock you into it. Uh, and in size imager, you can adjust the colors. So it's basically this band of blue that you're looking for or this band of high coherency data that you're looking for because while there's different waveforms at all the different scales of structure, you also have just geologic structure. That's what we're looking for. That's what determines the highest coherency phase velocities across frequency. It's what's that rock type that you encountered from 30 to 60 meters, what's it made of, and what's the dominant phase velocity of that material. Local effects will change that, right? Porosity, the water level, uh, how much the water is there, uh, erosion, the type of contact, is it a fault? All these things can affect the phase velocity, but fundamentally, the phase velocity represents the large-scale structural geology underneath your feet when you record that data. So that's how you understand a phase velocity diagram. So we're going to change our velocity image make sure that we're getting everything. So we'll just bump this up to like 1500, which would be like the top end of a site class B or near site class A. Very unlikely. I know the geology of the site, and we were nowhere near that. So if we drink, if we bring down our minimum pick line, I would say this section here at like 300 or so, that's like the only part of this data that looks good. Other than that, this is all noise. You know, I guess you can start to use this green band here a bit. There's a little bit of the start of blue here. So maybe there's some good data there. And then you know, it's just this 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 gap of um, kind of like pink, uh, magenta, and red going all the way through is not good. So we're going to bring that line down there. And this is really really wacky because we have we have what looks like a a peak in the data here. It kind of levels off and forms a little bit of a flat line, but then it like shoots up to. 1100 meters per second and for reference this data was collected um, in an area of uh, these rolling volcanics and but there's this thick alluvium layer on top of it and it's agricultural and that alluvium was it's very clay so it's very clay based and during the survey, it was extremely desiccated. There was like no water and it formed these huge cracks. And actually you could pull out chunks of clay. So nothing was held together. Uh, you would put your sink, you put your geophone into the ground and you just, there was no good coupling. You could not couple geophones well. And maybe it would have been slightly better if you had put base plates on the geophone and then put a sandbag on top that might have worked better but it's really an unknown but the the data was collected for nearly an hour so in terms of time it's not a time issue and it was in a quiet area so it's not a issue of noise it really was a coupling issue this data does not look good because of its coupling but there's really there wasn't really a way to fix that. It's just the, the ground, the way the ground was set up is so desiccated and it just it was like these big, big chunks of clay that were just held together barely by friction and you could just pull them out of the ground. And if you pulled them out to try to put your G-phone deeper, it just kept going, it was endless. So how do you solve that problem? Well, you know, like, you know how, how, do you, how do you process this and make it look good? Well, let's go back. And let's look at our survey geometry. So we'll go back, we'll go back. Let's go to view. And this will be our GPS survey geometry. But we can see here that this survey is collected with a long line here and then a shorter line there. So it was a L survey. And this uh, serial number 14 here was at um, 34 uh, Y axis, 34 uh, meters, and then our 35007 is our 3C seismograph, and that was at 00. And then this is a long line, and it has a 10 meter spacing. So I've already split these two lines into their separate array files. So one of the methods you could try, if you're having issues with the data set, 
is you can always try processing different parts of the data set individually and then combining the dispersion curves later in WaveUQ and seeing how that works. So I'm going to process this long line here because this is a 10 meter spacing, 100 meter long line. And then I'm going to process this line here. And both lines will have our 0, 0 point in them, our 3C atom, and we'll use the vertical data from that. And then I'm also going to take the good bits that we did see, the very few good bits from that um, overall dispersion curve, and we're going to add three dispersion curves together and see if we can get something that's usable. Okay, we'll go back again to our geometry. Let's first process this smaller section. So we'll hit, well, let's look. We need 46, 14, 15, 24, so we need 14 through 46, and then we need 07. Okay, so we're gonna have to remember to uh, ignore these boxes. So 50 through 72, we're gonna have to ignore. So we go to X, and then we go here, and we're gonna go to File, Advanced Options, and we're gonna ignore 50 through 72. So we have to type in the different serial numbers. Okay, and we hit OK. 10 boxes will be ignored. That, that makes sense because it's a 100 meter line that we're ignoring minus the zero, zero. So we have eight sensors, one common time block. You can see they've all tealed out. And now we have our Y34 point all the way to our zero, zero point. So now we get common time block. Existing data is cleared. Yes, vertical component. No on the band pass. And if we gain it up, this is what it looks like. We got 2,300 seconds. And we'll go to SPAC. Well, let's snip off this junk right there. And also on the right side, there's a little bit of noise for whatever reason. So we have our yellow gate left already on the left. We'll hit Shift and then right arrow just a couple times, just enough to cut that out. And then we'll tab over to the right side and we'll also cut this out. Now you can see it's much more balanced. That should help with the data processing. And you can see the big differences. Looks like 14 was coupled well while some of these were just coupled poorly, right? I mean, this one, the 3C has three spikes on it, so it's hard to sink that into the ground. And it's especially hard to find purchase with a, a three component geophone when it's all just like this loose, crumbly clay. Uh, the clay was extremely dense. You could not push the geophone into this clay. It was like cement, but they were held together by just like a little bit of friction. You could pull out these chunks. Very weird. Um, but you're going to take these principles and apply them to any data set. Um, that's just what happened for this one. So we'll go to SPAC. We're going to hit apply new geometry because we have new geometry now. So we're going to open up the uh, geometry that we want. And I'm going to confirm which one is which. So this is the geometry we want, split array one. So we're going to open that up. And hit OK. OK, good, good. And might clean up this a little bit. That minute for sure will be cleaned, that first minute. So I deleted that time block. And then I don't want to remove too much. But yeah, I think I think that's the only minute that we'll delete. This one is very well constrained to in that minute. So it's easy to do. So now let's go to our phase velocity and see what we can salvage from this. If we go up here, it doesn't look like there's all that much. Now, we have to keep in mind uh, a couple things. This was our 0 to 34 meter length straight line that we extracted from the L. So in terms of like getting really good data from 5 to 0 hertz, it's unlikely with a shorter array. I'm going to trust the data from the 100 meter line from that much more. But when it comes to data from like 10 to 20 hertz or so, uh, 
I'm going to trust that a bit more. So we can scroll down here and bring our minimum line. And I'd, well, let's bring it there first. I would say that the, I mean, it's tough to say, but I would say that we have okay data right here from like 13 to, I don't know, 13 to like 18 hertz, right? There's maybe something there that we can use. So let's, let's drag it down and see what that looks like. Okay. So it forms, it forms uh, these shelves, but we want to actually create a line there. So the data forms these shelves, but we're going to draw a line of high coherency and drag it through like that. And actually, we're going to clean up a little bit. It goes a little flat right there, right? And and now, what, whether whether it's, it goes completely flat there, hard to say. Uh, we're effectively ignoring everything else. And then, you know, maybe we have a little bit of good data like that. So let's, let's save that data, that 13 to 18 hertz. Let's save that. So we'll need to go to our dispersion curve to save it. So we'll click our uh, dispersion curve button here. It's going to open up wave EQ. Do you want to interpolate? I'm going to say no, because we don't have that much data that we're picking to begin with. So I'm going to hit no, and I'm just going to go straight to the gates. I'm going to move over our gates. And get each side of this. And now, before inversion, of course, we want to wait before inversion. We're going to save this. And this is going to be under impossible data. And we're going to save this as 13 to 18 hertz. Yeah. OK, save. So that, you know, if you look at the velocities here, 500 down to, you know, 230 or so. That's not unreasonable. It's a pretty steep line there, but it's the best we got. So we're going to go back now and we're going to go back and we're going to go back. And now we're going to go to and ignore the other boxes. So we no longer want to ignore these ones. We want to ignore the ones that we just selected, which would be 100014, 10015, 24, 33, 35, 43, and then also 46. And we should see the teal color just flip flop. There we go. Now we have our data from 50, or from zero rather, to 100 meters. Um, and we can hit common time block. Yes, because again, this is the 3C, so we want to select that vertical component. No to the band pass. Let's bump up our data a bit with the up arrow. And again, I'm going to cut off this right side. I just don't like that. Um, it's easy to do. We'll do snips. And I'd say at this point, you know, we're ready for the SPAC. So let's click that. Let's add our new geometry, which is the split array two. hit open. And we have uh, 11 receivers, and this is our 100 meter line with the 10 meter spacings. Okay. You can see it's a very small amount, but good amount of pairs. And here's our data. Okay. So we can see 10, 20, 30. We're not going to have anything other than 10 meter blocks. But this, you know, the data that we are getting from these 10 meter blocks is fairly good. And the reason why it would be better is because there's a high amount of space uh, pairings. There's a high amount of pairings on this data. There's only 10 different spacings, but the, for example, the 10 meter uh, pairing or the 10 meter spacing has 10 different pairings on it because there were, you know, if everyone's spaced across 10, 10 meters and you have a 10 meter wavelength from zero to 10, you have a 10 meter from 10 to 20, so on and so forth. So the further up you get, the, the less pairings you have backing each spacing, but this looks the best it can look. 
uh, considering the site condition. So we're going to go straight to, well, first let's bump up the game with the up arrow and see if there's any time blocks that we should delete. Something that sticks out, but nothing is really, nothing's really sticking out, I would say. So let's just go straight to PV and hit OK. And it looks like we got a little bit more to work with now. So if we bring this line up, we can see that we have a good, um, we have much more blue in the data. And, you know, maybe we even have a, a line here, right there. Now, now this is a weird feature. And, and, and linear arrays will often be this kind of like crisp, um, it'll be like this, it'll have this crisp look to it. And because there's no dimensionality to it. So you have to be careful. But we can see this, this line going right up to about um, about 18 hertz. And we're going to drop our minimum phase velocity line in order to get it underneath this high coherency cluster data. And the software will auto detect the areas of highest coherency. So our data looks good to about 800 or so. And again, we're really only interested in picking the peak of this. And then, and then it goes down here. So we're going to save our data for this one from zero to uh, 15 or so. And let's start to drag this down. And we're going to go, we're, again, we're going to go right to this section. You know, that, I'm not sure about that, but that would make a pretty steep line. This looks better, though. So we're going to drag that back down. And from here, we're going to start to create that curve. So left click. And there we go. And at this point, let's go to our phase velocity here. And no, we're not going to interpolate in between. And we're going to start to cut this out with the gates. So I'm going to leave this, this left gate there. We can delete those points later. But I am going to cut out the data beyond like 13 hertz. I think our data up to 13 is good. And then we'll save this as 0 to 13. Okay, and now we're going to go back and do our final pick, which is going to be from the full data set, see if we can uh, get anything good out of that. And we're going to hit open, go back to our impossible data, and I do not want to ignore the boxes. I'm going to go through Common time block, vertical, yes, okay, no on the band pass. And I'm going to snip out that first little bit of data again. First on that side and also on the left side or the right side. And hit the snips, looks much better. And then we'll hit SPAC, but this time we want our full array. So we'll hit array here, open. 18 receivers, okay. All the prompts, just telling you your different spacings and pairings. And we're back to the screen again. You know, this data is odd. I'm going to delete that first minute again. But other than that, we're going to go phase velocity, 30 for the maximum frequency shown. And again, we have our wacky data, but I'm going to select this right here and then I'm also going to select this section right there, which I believe we got uh, a pretty good constraint on with the last section that we did, the, the 100 meter line. But we can put all three of these dispersion curves together and then choose our data from that. So so looking at this,
Go back up again. I just want to make sure I pick the range correctly. You know, this one, this one's looking good all the way. I, I, I'm feeling more confident in this now. So let's drag it back down. That line there, except where it just drops off there. I can fix that just as a little left click over and actually come up those two legs that were down there. Okay, we're gonna cut this at like 16 hertz. And here's our bunch of data again. I'm gonna draw that line going down through no man's land here. And this is our data. So we're going to now go to the dispersion curve button, not going to interpolate, and we're going to delete picks outside the gate. So on this one, I'm going to, we have a little bit of a, like a shelf that we form. So I'm going to select from that left side of the shelf and again, I'm going to go and cut it at about 16 or so. So right about here. And I'm going to clean this one up because we have some crazy data that's just bumping off the top and the bottom. So again, your red, your red box with the arrow is how you select and grab. And I grab too much, so I'll just click the white arrow to deselect. And then I can go in here and sometimes it'd be a little difficult to grab them. But that looks good. And I'm going to delete this one too. Okay. And actually, that dispersion curve doesn't look that bad. Of course, I drew that, right? So it's good to it's good to add in your other your other dispersion curve. So let's add in our 0 through 13. Hit open. And well, actually, let's let's cancel this. Let's save this first so we don't have to do this again. So this is going to be, I'm just going to call this total. No, well, not total. I'm going to call it, um, uh, well, total. Let's just call it total. Okay, so now we can add in, let's increase our axes, our y to 1,000. So it's a little easier to see. Okay, so I'm now going to add in the others. And when you, can, when you add them in, you can average or you can just drop them in and it'll show up as a different color and you'll see how close the picks are to each other. So I'm not going to average them yet. I want to see what these look like. I can always go back and do that later. So I'm going to 13, we're going to append. Do you want to average? That's the question. No, we're not going to average these. I want to see how well they overlap. So no. Okay, that looks good. And then I'm going to open and I'm going to open that one. I'm going to append. I'm not going to average. And here we get, it looks like this guy was quite a bit off. And actually, looks like we didn't really get any. Well, yeah, I'm, it's questionable. Well, with the 34, with a 34 meter line, you're going to get the best data with a spacing like that. A spacing that has one and two meter. You're going to get the best. Uh, penetration into like the the, the very near sur subsurface with uh, the near the close spacings of like one two meters. So this might be good. This section might be good. Clearly, this section is is just kind of bogus. So what we can do is we can fix that. So we can find right where it's about three thirty, and we'll just delete that. So we're going to open up our thirteen thirteen through eighteen. Let's hit new data. No and I'm going to select this and add about 330. Right about there. I'm going to save that again. Of course, it's not 1318 anymore, but we'll just remember. And now we're going to open up our 0 through 13. I'm going to append. And this one we are going to average. And then we're going to open up our total and we're going to append and we are going to average and here is our dispersion curve an impossible data dispersion curve if I delete that point there some of these little stragglers here I don't like and then 
maybe just round that top just a tad and then we're going to pick we're going to pick our data and I'm going to start we can always we can always do this again but I'm going to do the first gate there second gate there that's that's our initial sweep of the data and yes we have a higher velocity here at a higher frequency so this is like four hertz and then at three hertz it's a little bit lower but again it's all within like the seven to 770 range so there's not that much of a difference there uh, i think that's fine and then going down here it looks good what we can do with instances like this is that this is when i like to smooth it out so this will help smooth out the curves between here it'll help smooth there it'll help smooth this out so let's hit smooth individual curves and now let's look at our vr model and our vr model looks good you know that 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 curve at the low frequency actually is pretty flat and we have data to 95 and our axis is off so we have to increase this to like a thousand okay so now we go to our initial model well, we 95. Here's our initial model of all three dispersion curves combined, but again, just one survey. And if we look at our dispersion curve and calculate the theoretical, our theoretical is 44. So not fantastic, but also totally still good. And now what we can do is we can now invert the data. So or, We'll do some inversion. So we'll do a least squares inversion for the um, for the data. Five iterations. Hit OK and see you in a little bit. Inversion has completed. We'll hit OK and if we if we look at our data, maybe bring that in a little bit. That's what it looks like. If we go to our display here, our RMS error is 21. So if you are clever and if you think of different ways to process, you can take data which might look impossible to process and turn it into something usable. Now, if you have the ability to go back to the site, definitely do a second survey. But sometimes that's not possible. And sometimes you know that everything was good. Your survey geometry was good. Maybe it's just one or two factors that threw it off a little bit. But with a little bit of cleverness, you can definitely get really good data out of results that look totally impossible to process. So in this example, we split the L survey into its two different sections. And also we looked at the total data, collected dispersion curves from each, and then combined them all. And maybe in another example, you'd only select a certain time window for a certain section, right? There's different ways to slice and dice your data to extract the good parts. And then you can go back and retroactively combine them. Again, the SBAC method all works about averages. So if you can find areas where the averages are good, then you should be able to get good data out of what might look bad at first glance. Thank you for watching.